Hello, my fellow Ethereans. This is Mike Jenkins back with episode nine of the Shira Princess of Power comprehensive review series. Oh, I need to shorten that name. And in episode nine, we are going over the titular character of the brand, Shira, Princess of Power herself. This one's probably going to be a doozy. I'm going to go over the history of Shira's creation, as well as the vintage figure and the Masters of the Universe classics, Shira and Adora figures. The variants that Shira has, I will go over in separate videos. This is a little bit different from Catra, where I had three parts to the to the review, and I kind of did a, a quick wash over her variants. With Shira, I'm going to break it up and do her variants in separate videos. I have Adora here with Shira because in the original vintage release of the Shira figure. Adora and Shira were actually the same figure. So some people might know that, some people might not know that, but Adora did indeed get released in the vintage toy line, just not as she appeared on the cartoon series. So let's get into this. We're going to start from the beginning. The beginning of the Shira character arguably started as early as 1979, according to some accounts from various individuals who contributed to the creation of She-Ra. Mattel had actually started working on an action fashion doll line as early as 1979. This is according to interviews and research that Jim Tallstar did on the He-Man.org site. That action fashion doll line was never taken to retail. It was never developed far enough to actually get picked up and become a successful toy line or a toy line period. So the girls department at Mattel had worked on an action fashion doll concept even before Masters of the Universe had come into being. But that concept just didn't take off and was eventually shelved, as many concepts do come and go in toy development. So Masters of the Universe comes out onto the shelves in 1982. It becomes a sleeper success and rambling start amongst members of the boys department that perhaps... He-Man needs a female counterpart. Roger Sweet accounted in his book, Mastering the Universe, He-Man and the Rise and Fall of a Billion Dollar Idea. He accounted in that book how he had come up with an idea in 1980 of developing a family for He-Man. So like a wife and he-Man kids, and similar to the concept of Captain Marvel, who went on to have Mary Marvel and Captain Marvel Jr. and several other Marvel members of his little group there. The idea was passed on to He-Man. He should have this type of evolution as well. That really didn't get pushed or chased after. You know, Roger Sweet came up with the idea, but he really didn't push it. Mark Taylor as well um, apparently came up with an idea about a female He-Man, but really didn't push it. Lou Scheimer had talked about doing a female version of He-Man to empower girls, but he really wasn't in a position to make it happen. So, again, in Roger Sweet's book, he accounts how 38% of Masters of the Universe sales was to girls. Tila was the breakout success, or a breakout success in the toy line, and was selling remarkably well. And once the numbers came in for Masters of the Universe, 
between the 82 line and 83 line, it became pretty clear that girls, 38% of them, were part of the consumer base for Masters of the Universe. So this was all the evidence Mattel needed. Mark Ellis, director of Boys Toys Marketing, pushed the idea for a female action figure line. The idea was to create a flanker line that would boost sales for both He-Man and Barbie's toy sales. In Jim Tallstar's interview with Chris McAdam, it's revealed that Princess of Power was not started in the girls' department, as many people would believe or suspect. The new business concept group took on the duties of doing preliminary designs for this female He-Man in her castle. Susanna Rosenthal was the head of New Business Concepts, which was a separate Blue Sky design team. It seems that it was here that Justine Dancer worked on design concepts for Barbie and sequentially the toys that would become Princess of Power. Justine Dancer, who had worked at Kenner previously to Mattel, she actually worked at Kenner after a, a stint at Mattel and worked on things like the Care Bears and eventually ended up back at Mattel. And because of her work at Kenner on concepts for the Superpowers line, Superpowers was actually looking to do some spinoff lines for Wonder Woman and even Lois Lane. And Justine Dancer had worked on concepts for that. So she had a portfolio for powerful female action figure oriented concepts. So when it came time to design and develop a female action figure toy line that would be spun off from He-Man, Justine Dancer was the right person to go to. She designed She-Ra, Crystal Castle, a preliminary of Angela and Glimmer. She developed Bo and Cow, Catra, Castispella, and Swiftwind. Her partner, Jennifer Kiernan, created Double Trouble and Frosta. These characters would represent the first wave of Princess of Power. Kiernan also finalized Angela and feminized her a little more than what she was. Justine Dancer worked on several designs that started with a Tila concept. This was likely intentional, according to Dancer, because it was Tila that sparked this new line of toys. And initial plans were centered around sharing parts, uh, similar to what we got with Tila and Evil Lynn. The figure evolved into more of a bird Valkyrie theme, apparently due to Dancer's favor of eagles. Dancer's second design of the female He Man was closer to the final toy. There were many designs going back and forth between Mattel and Filmation. Like many Masters of the Universe characters before them, Princess of Power characters typically continued evolving beyond designs locked in by filmation. This is due to audience testing and design production logistics. And so once the decision was made to focus the Princess of Power line on being a Barbie flanker line, not a boys or unisex line. The designs were all feminized by Chris McAdams and others in the girls' department. This happened after character designs were locked in for the cartoon, never to be changed for the reasons of cost and time measures. Since the female He-Man and the evil Horde were being developed at the same time, it made sense to tie them together in their introduction on the cartoon series. The Evil Horde developed or came into being from a separate pool of designers in the boys department. And, you know, they were going to be released in 1985. And there was just the question of how were they going to be released. With the advent of this new female He-Man, the idea came together that, oh, well, we've got this, this female He-Man, and we've got the evil Horde. They both have to be introduced in 1985. It seems to be that they're either 
part of Masters of the Universe or directly related to Masters of the Universe. So let's make them one thing. This is the reason why the evil horde is inseparable from Princess of Power. You can't take the evil horde out of She-Ra's origin. Even in the mini comics, which, or the toy line continuity, which does a lot of work to separate itself from Masters of the Universe, the first mini comic cannot avoid acknowledging that Hordak abducted Princess Sidora and took her to Etheria. That's the only time Hordak appears in the toy continuity, but that happens to be Shira's origin. And so every depiction of Shira's origin, whatever piece of fiction you have, Hordak and the Evil Horde are part of her origin. This plan to intertwine the Evil Horde with the female He-Man concept seemed a logical evolution for a line that would act as an extension of Masters of the Universe. This line was also planned to help refresh and boost sales for both He-Man and Barbie. Filmation worked out the introduction of the female He-Man in the Evil Horde, having the design and animation team collaborating very closely with Mattel on character designs, and having Filmation's Larry Dottilio create the world of Etheria, along with the Star Wars-influenced Horde Empire versus Great Rebellion dynamic. Dottilio was the one that named She-Ra. The name She-Ra came into place after names like Hera or Hera and Shiro were rejected. Dottilio wrote the Princess of Power series Bible, along with the origin story Secret of the Sword. He also created a number of characters exclusive to the show, like Shadow Weaver and Scorpia. Meanwhile, Judy Shackelford, a Mattel exec and vice president of girls' toy marketing, took the female action figure concepts with the ideology that the girls' department knew best how to design for girls. Based on initial scopes shown in a presentation, it seems the consensus was that the figures were too masculine and rugged, despite plans for the line being created in the likeness of Tila, which was sculpted hair, battle weapons, and sculpted outfits. Initially, it looks like the line would have been pushed towards boys and girls, similar to the tone of the cartoon. However, Barbie traditionalism rejected this female action figure toy line, particularly with Shackelford's stance. She turned the line over to Jill Barad, girls' toy marketing director. Sequentially, Janice Varney, director of Worldwide Fashion Dolls, merged the girls' department's previously failed action fashion doll concept with this new Masters of the Universe spinoff, thus creating the Princess of Power toy line as it came to be known. As part of feminizing the line, Features like rooted hair and styleable hair, removable and exchangeable clothing, and soft and glittery color palettes were made core features of the Princess of Power toy line. According to Tallstar's interviews, Kathy Larson, the product manager, coined the name Adora, Shira's alter ego. She wanted to name her Dorian, after her daughter. Presumably, a name that was a female turn on Adam was desired, and so Adora became the compromise. Larson would also be instrumental in creating the mini comics and the Golden Books. The She-Ra action fashion doll had an ability that took advantage of the fashion features of the line. Unlike her brother, who had to have his two personas represented by two toys, Adora and She-Ra were one figure with two different fashions. Depending on the media, Adora is the figure with all of the accessories removed. In the mini comics, this concept changed a few times. Early on, Adora and Shira wore the same attire. The only difference was how she wore the tiara. The full-faced pose was Adora, 
the upside down mast poles with Shira. Later, Adora wore everything but the tiara, and Shira's tiara looked more like the cartoon version. For a while, Shira shared the masked, unmasked feature with her nemesis Catra, but because the cartoon and presumably audience testing didn't favor the feature, it was dropped. Unfortunately, a cartoon accurate version of Adora was never produced. Perhaps Mattel saw no need to make an Adora figure since she was technically already in the line. Also, Mattel would have to pay royalties for characters designed by Filmation, so they held out on that for as long as possible. The Sorceress endured the same dilemma, getting a cartoon accurate toy very late in the line, most likely due to demand. But technically, the Sorceress already had a figure in the line in the form of Cobra Armor Tila. Being the titular character of Princess of Power, Shira and Adora appeared in all media. That's the cartoons, comics, the magazines, the books, etc. She was even designed for the 1987 motion picture by William Stout, but due to budget and time, she did not appear. Here is vintage Shira and Adora. When you buy the figure, it's one figure. But one of the great features of the Princess of Power toy line is the ability to remove clothing and accessories and replace them with other clothing and accessories. You can swap Shearer's clothes for Glimmer's clothes. Uh, you could swap Shearer's accessories for Catra's accessories. They even had the Fantastic Fashion line or subline of Princess of Power, which offered new outfits for the figures. Some of the outfits matched up with certain figures better than others, um, but it made for the opportunity to give a new, fresh, alternate look to your existing toys. So the great piece of playware that the designers of Princess of Power came up with for She-Ra and Adora was releasing one figure that represented two halves of one character. So again, instead of having a separate action figure for Adora and one for She-Ra, both were represented with one toy. All you had to do was take off the tiara, take off the cape, take away the, the, the sword and shield, and you have Adora. Add those items on, and you have She-Ra. For the most part, even the She-Ra variants didn't change much. There were some um, practical design changes that happened because of certain action features and whatnot. But for the most part, the design of the of the figure remained the same. And the main differences were the clothing and accessories that were added. Uh, I'm going to work with Adora here, and she has. the battle waist. She has the pivoting head and she has articulation in the arms and articulation in the legs. The figure came with what you see here which is the tiara, the cape with collar, the dress, the sword, and the shield. A lot of fans would have protested if they held out on releasing Shira. So they made good and made sure that Shira was released, um, what, about a year into the toy line. So <clears throat> Adora actually came first in the year. Uh, she was released in, I believe it was January of 2010. 
Shira came later that summer. And this version that I have on display here is actually Shira 2.0. She is my definitive Shira in the collection. She was released as Bubble Power Shira. The great thing about that figure was that they made improvements to the first Shira release. The first Shira was stripped of detail. So no detail on the gauntlets, no detail on the boots, no detail on the belt. She looked like she jumped right out of filmation. So for some collectors, that's the right Shira to have. Another issue, though, with that first release was that the white that they used in Shira's outfit was kind of a dirty gray. And if they ever made Swift Wind, the dress was made in a way that it was a harder plastic and Shira could only split her legs so far. So she wouldn't have been able to sit on Swift Wind. So when the time came to do a Shira variant, they released Bubble Power Shira and made it so that you could swap the accessories. That was one of the great features about those first two Shira figures, was that you could swap the accessories. You could swap the tiara, you could swap heads, you could swap um, the sword and shield and all the accessories, and you could create this definitive Shira 2.0. So her boots have detail that are taken from the vintage figure. Her gauntlets have detail that come from the vintage figure. She has the golden sword, which is influenced by the vintage figure. And she has the shield, which is influenced by the vintage figure. What's new with both of the, those Shira releases is the Axe Comb, which is an homage to all of the comb accessories that came with the vintage Princess of Power figures. Her brother had a shield, a sword, and an axe, and it just seemed appropriate that classic Shira would have the same matching accessories. That first Shira also came with an alternate head. The one head was mostly or mainly based on the filmation or style guide design. The secondary head that came with the first Shira Classics figure was based on the uh, vintage figure that had the uh, tiara. And so this head actually has a hole in it, which kind of makes it a bit inferior for some, some collectors. Uh, the bubble power figure that I'll do a video on later down the road here has a removable tiara that looks exactly like the vintage one. This one, um, the Four Horsemen, I think we're trying to make this tiara more practical, more battle ready. Uh, some people refer to the vintage tiara as a dog collar and so it's possible, I suspect, that the Four Horsemen may have thought that the original uh, vintage tiara was too was just too much so they tried to trim it down um, but for some reason it just doesn't work it just doesn't capture that vintage feel I applaud the four horsemen for what they were going trying to go for but it just doesn't have that vintage feel so that's why with bubble power Shira they made sure to match match that tiara spot on um, but this 
Tiara does have the same ability of swapping around and giving you either version of masked or unmasked, which um, is a feature that some collectors like, some collectors ignore. Classics Adora was released early on in 2010 of the Classics line. And she is taken right from the style guide, right from the filmation cartoon design. She has the shorter hair. She has the outfit that uh, she wore in the Evil Horde and Great Rebellion. She came with a silver version of the Sword of Protection. Shira came with the gold version to pay homage to the vintage figure. Adora here also came with a a holster and pistol. So that's what completes that figure. She has the standard articulation. Her head is limited by uh, her hair sculpt. But she has the typical articulation. One of the complaints with this figure was the uh, what some people call the granny pants. I personally don't take issue with it. I see it more as it's more of a type of skirt. I don't really look at it as um, a bathing suit type of leotard type of outfit. Um, but I tend to ignore some of the glaring issues um, as opposed to some people who kind of drill in on them. That's, that's just how my mind works. But she's a great figure. Um, the only issue I would say there is is the limit in her head articulation. And as I pointed out, the for some collectors, the granny panties. And that is my review of She-Ra, Princess of Power. Not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be more of a mouthful. thought I was going to have to break it up into a bunch of pieces. But again, I'm going to do the variants in separate videos. And also, I'll talk about Swift Wind in his own video. And the Steeds will have their own videos. So, Shira is an important piece of history, of action figure history and has had a strong influence on female superheroes and female characters and toy lines uh, to this day. Uh, female characters do continue to struggle in uh, cartoon series and toy lines because of sexism, let's just say. But because of icons like She-Ra, Xena, and particularly Wonder Woman, I expect those traditions to continue ebbing away, and one day we will perhaps have a unisex toy line starring powerful warrior maidens like She-Ra, where we don't have to worry about should it be in the pink owl, should it be in the blue owl? Just sell it and let the collectors buy what they want. Okay, join me next time for episode 10, which will be Mermista. The mermaid of the Princess of Power toy line, one of my favorite characters. So until then, ta-ta for now.